Hello and welcome to Solving the Supply Chain Last Mile Delivery Logistics Puzzle. Today's smart panel is sponsored by OneRail and produced by SmartBrief. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from SmartBrief and I'm excited to be your moderator for this fireside chat style conversation. Now, before we get to today's great content, we do have a few housekeeping items that are going to help you get the most out of this session. So first off, let's talk questions. We want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel. The Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues that you might be experiencing. So a browser refresh will fix most audio, video, or slide advancement issues. But if that doesn't work, just let us know in the Q&A and we'll provide further technical assistance. Okay, next, handouts. So in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources. I'd especially like to call your attention to a one-page overview of OneRail and a guide for evaluating last mile delivery software. So I encourage you to access those resources now and share them with your friends and colleagues. Now, I'm sure you also noticed the prize icon there. At the end of this webinar event, we'll be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. So of course you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. The official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can be found in the handout section. Just scroll down to the bottom and you'll find the prize terms and conditions link there. And with that, let's get into today's panel discussion. So, you know, inflation, the economy's overall state, and labor shortages have all affected supply chain operations. But as we've moved through 2024, a focus on on-time performance has taken hold. And so the biggest puzzle piece still to solve is last mile delivery. Today, we're gonna to cover things like how supply chain managers can resolve the last mile delivery conundrum, the best last mile strategies, the role sustainability and efficiency play in operations, and how customer service is evolving and driving decisions. And who better to illuminate those challenges than our guest today? We have OneRail founder and CEO, Bill Catania. Bill is a startup entrepreneur focused on developing and commercializing real-time technology networks. OneRail is a leading omnichannel fulfillment solution pairing best-in-class software with logistics as a service. They're dedicated to providing dependability and speed to help businesses meet their delivery promise. So for scale, OneRail has a real-time connected network of 12 million drivers. And OneRail, one of course, isn't Bill's only retail startup. He also founded digital coupon pioneer MDOT Network, the first of its kind retail point of service to, or point of sale to, uh, to cloud transaction engine, powering the real-time redemption of digital coupons at grocery checkouts throughout North America. So Bill, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, you know, so so happy to have you here. Now, I, I said a little bit about OneRail, but but could you tell the audience just a little bit more about the company and, and what you do? Yeah, OneRail is a last mile omni-channel fulfillment solution. And what that means is we give our customers capabilities to really execute a lot of the things that Amazon have perfected that they've invested over a hundred billion dollars in developing, we give them those capabilities, leveraging a lot of their assets, their warehouses, their stores, and unlocking that with our transportation network, our technology, and our team uh, that provides support. So think about it as almost an Amazon in the box type, type solution where you can offer same day fulfillment from store in 30 minutes or less, same day, anytime, next day but also orchestrate your overall shipping strategy, whether it be parcel ship from store, warehouse, LTL. Um, it, it really uh, is the unlock uh, to being able to put the customer at the center of your universe. Very cool. All right, great. Well, you know, th that obviously dovetails perfectly into what we're talking about. So let's, let's set the stage. You know, what are the biggest barriers facing supply chain managers when it comes to that last mile delivery? Just everything, <laughs> you know, so that's a vague answer, but, but what, what they're facing are a lot of challenges. I mean, if, if I had to break it down, there's really four things that that uh, are, are the biggest challenges that many things can kind of roll up to. Uh, one is technology. Uh, you know, the concept of last mile and omni-channel orchestration is, is a relatively new thing, right? You have uh, decades old TMS solutions that have been in place 
you have decades old OMS solutions that have been in place and somehow they need to figure out what's the best way dynamically to fulfill product to a customer so that the customer can have uh, flexible shipping solutions, low cost or no cost shipping. Uh, and notice I said flexible, I didn't say had to be fast. And I think that's a big misnomer. Uh, dependable and when the customer wants uh, their delivery are the two most important things. Fast should be an option but it doesn't mean it has to be fast. Um, so technology is a big problem. The other is procurement. And now that sounds weird. How is procurement a problem? Many, many shippers, especially retailers, have gone out with kind of a single or, or limited carrier strategy. And what we encourage our customers to do is have a multi-carrier strategy. Think of it as having a mutual fund versus a stock. You put all your money in one stock, the stock doesn't do well, you lose money, right? Uh, mm -hmm put all your money in a mutual fund, you have 2000 stocks, you know, some will go up, some will go down, but you have a much more even performance. So procuring, how you procure your transportation, uh, how to execute a procurement strategy um, so that you have a multi-carrier focus and not just for the reason of, of performance, think about a retailer like Lowe's Home Improvement, who happens to be one of our customers. We're shipping everything from a, a gallon of paint to two or 3,000 pounds of, of products to a job site for a Lowe's Pro. So how do you have a range of delivery assets that can support virtually any type of delivery, any type of delivery speed, weight, cubic inches, et cetera. So how you procure has to change. You have to, you have to kind of forget how you've done it for 30 years and think about it a little bit differently. Um, the third is process. You know, things that we're doing, we, I'm really surprised and I'm not, I'm not disappointed, I'm just surprised at how much we lean in with our customers to help them solve uh, store operations, sort of re-architecting. So now, you know, let's take a, a retailer that's maybe pushed everything out the back door of the store in a box truck, you know, for years, uh, scheduled deliveries, but now we're gonna do same day. We're gonna do it out the front of the store. Think about all the challenges uh, that you face, right? And trying to do that across thousands of stores with hundreds of thousands of associates. That's what we're geared up to do. Um, and we help our customers kind of aggregate the best practices across our whole network so they can solve those problems easily in the first time. Uh, and then lastly, people. If you're going to execute a true kind of last mile omni-channel strategy, fulfill from store, expedited, uh, same day, you have to think about this more as a shopper marketing exercise and less of a, of a logistics concern. And I think what we do is we take the logistics components and make them easy so that our customers can achieve their, their, their shopper marketing goals. At the end of the day, this is a shopper marketing exercise. I think Amazon mm -hmm. proved us right on that. Okay, so it was, it was technology and the three Ps, um, procurement, <laughs> process, and people. I like that. Um, yeah. what and, about on, and here's the other, yeah, the other thing. So if, you can do, if you can do those things, you can solve for the fourth P, which is price. If you can do all yeah. those things right, you can actually offer an affordable uh, last mile solution, which I think the unit economics of last mile have been upside down forever, right? They really, mm -hmm. you hear a lot about retailers subsidizing and, you know, not really being able to contemplate margin versus fulfillment cost. And then there's retailers that make delivery available at too high of a cost for the customer. The customer says, I expect free delivery because Amazon gives me free delivery. Uh, where I pay prime once a year and I get, you know, I get all the benefit out of that. So, so that fourth P super important. Um, hmm. and, it, and, it, and it, and it's, but it's an output of those, those three inputs or four Fourth's, inputs. Yeah. 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 Great point. Um, so what about on the other side, what are some of the biggest opportunities, um, around, you know, last mile delivery? Well, I think, I think the retailers that have done, a fabulous job, you know, kind of in the early days have demonstrated that you can win the customer, right? That's the opportunity. The opportunity is win the customer. And you think about retail evolution and what Sears did. Think about Sears and the impact that Sears had on retail uh, in the mid 1900s. They had to literally re-architect the roads in Chicago to bring the mail in and out of the Sears building. That's how much disruption that Sears caused to retail. Oh. 
And they did a good job putting the customer first in the early days. Amazon creates the next wave or revolution of, of, of putting a customer even, even more in the center of the universe. Um, and they've done a good job of that. So I think that the answers to the test have already been given out, right? Give your customers flexible options, wide assortment, low cost. That's the opportunity is to win the customer. And if you can provide large assortment, low cost, flexible shipping, you win. And, and to me, that's, that is the opportunity. Like I, I could list a whole bunch of opportunities, but at the end of the day, what, the word omni-channel, I, I go back to 2013, <laughs> like that's 50 years ago in technology years, kind of like dog years, but technology years. <laughs> I was on stage speaking at the NCR uh, annual event about digital couponing and, and shopper marketing. And mm -hmm. omni-channel was like the buzzword then. And mm -hmm. what I learned between 2013 and when I started this company was you can talk all you want about it. You can talk about designing an omni-channel marketing platform, which is actually a path that I started going down before I started this company. But that's not going to do anything for you unless you can actually fulfill the promise and give the customer flex the flexibility and optionality they need. And, and that's why I did this was we're going to solve this problem. You know, this is the problem that I think is the bigger problem, not how to connect all the touch points for an omni-channel marketing strategy. Marketing is worthless if you can't execute. Hmm. Yeah, you know, and one other thing that I wanted to ask, you know, just kind of your view on being sort of like just in the, in the center of the industry, just just some of the, the, the buzzwords that are out there around, uh, you know, last mile delivery, like, you know, crowdsource delivery services, you know, like a, a DoorDash and, and then drone technology gets talked about all the time and sort of that that last mile um, yeah. micro fulfillment centers, um, you know, any any of those have sort of uh, legs for, for organizations? They certainly do. You know, they're, they're all they're all tools, though. I think what I've learned is, you know, going out and starting this company and raising capital you know, I have to be accountable to the capital markets and, and not like a public company does, but probably in some ways even more rigid uh, in terms of what the expectations are uh, being an earlier stage company. And yeah. at the end of the day, you know, we get we get a lot of questions about how is drone delivery going to disrupt, you know, one rail? Well, no, you know, drone delivery is something we would orchestrate, right? It's a tool. All of those things are tools that a retailer needs to have in their arsenal. Um, we're a huge advocate for crowdsource delivery. And if you look at our model, the reason it works is we're crowdsourcing supply and demand at the same time. So we're crowdsourcing demand from our, our network of retailers, Lowe's, Advance, Tractor Supply, uh, Signet Jewelers, which owns many different jewelry brands like K and Zales, uh, Wholesalers like Ferguson Industries, American Tire Distributors, PepsiCo as a product manufacturer. All that demand is in one pool and we connect it with crowdsourced supply. Our crowdsourced supply, you referenced it at the beginning of the call, uh, are, are entirely our courier network of about a thousand networks. So it's a network of networks, DoorDash, mm -hmm. Uber, Snipcart, GoShare, Freight. So when you can crowdsource supply and demand simultaneously, you can create unit economic advantage really for the shipper. It's also good for the carrier because the carrier now is going to get business that they wouldn't have gotten before uh, by mm -hmm. plugging into one company, which is us. So we kind of sit at the, at the, at the, uh, the center of the crossroads of supply and demand. That's really what we're doing. Um, so yes, crowdsourcing is, is absolutely more than a buzzword. It really works. It's one of the reasons why our, our company continues to grow at over hundred percent a year. And we expect to again the next year. Um, and then micro fulfillment is something that I think is underutilized. But I think the reason it's underutilized is it hasn't there hasn't been enough efficiency yet, um, whether it be a wholesaler or a retailer, to really understand how to leverage micro fulfillment. There's some companies that have done a great job with it, um, but I think it's still a little bit out there on the roadmap. Drone delivery. There's a massive need for drone delivery, especially in healthcare. You have mission critical deliveries and you're in the middle of a city and it's a 30 minute drive to go a 10th of a mile, but you could dispatch a drone in five minutes to get a life-saving uh, 
uh, medication or perhaps it's even, you know, something more sensitive like live tissue. I mean, there's real serious implications to that. So uh, it also helps with the density issue when you start thinking about deliveries in a rural area. You know, if you could if you could dispatch a drone instead of a, a vehicle to a delivery, you know, in rural Wyoming, that potentially could have, you know, favorable unit economics versus deploying a truck that you know, is going to drive 60 miles one way to deliver something that might not be worth $60. So um, those are all, they, they do get treated as buzzwords, but I think the problem is some people idealize them as the end all be all, right? The easy mm -hmm. button. And I'm here to tell you, there's no, there's no single easy button to yeah. fixing every problem to, to, to compete on par with, again, an Amazon, a Walmart, who's done an exceptional job as a retailer, but they've also invested billions of dollars. You know, who can do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great point of just positioning them as, as tools, um, you know, that yeah. fill a, a niche uh, and then, you know, you need other tools in the, in the toolbox. The, the so, ultimate tool is, is 3D printing. It makes the whole, you know, the whole first and second mile or first and middle mile go away, right? You don't even need first and middle mile. You just And if, if you could get 3D printing in the home, you don't even need last mile. So yeah. if you want to disrupt, if you want to disrupt one rail, just deploy uh, 3D printing in every home in America so you could print whatever you need and it would obsolete a lot of things. <laughs> Um, so one rail has been at the forefront of last mile delivery solutions. Can, can you share how the company is leveraging some technology such as AI, cloud computing and data analytics to, to address the complexities of that last mile delivery? Yeah. I mean, we realized early on, you know, the first iteration of one rail, um, was not what you see here today. Um, it was, you know, we were a tech connected courier and, that tech connected courier was called Zapped. And we, we, we were a lot like some of the other tech connected couriers. We had an app, it was consumer facing. We had to go recruit drivers. So we learned the hard way, you know, that's a very challenging use case. Again, if, if, if unit economic advantage lies within matching supply and demand, how do you ever get to an efficient point without losing hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So yeah. we realized we needed to become one rail so that we could become, you know, a lot more efficient at aggregating supply and demand. So to do that, we needed technology. And the only way you can do that is technology. So our technology, we think of it as an operating system. Uh, it's called OmniPoint for, for a reason. It's an omni-channel enablement solution. And it is the single point you need to be able to Oh, we just lost uh, lost Bill there for a second. Oh, you're back. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, where did you? Yeah, leave you just kind of winked out, and then you were right back. Go, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what I was saying is our technology, our our platform, is called OmniPoint, and OmniPoint sits at the center of supply and demand, and every order from our shippers flows into OmniPoint. And then what the platform is doing is based on an algorithm, based on machine learning and AI, we're dispatching to couriers based on their historical performance. So think of it like a credit score for couriers. We know in Atlanta, Georgia, between 11 a.m. and noon for a 30 minute delivery that's less than 50 pounds and going to go less than 10 miles. We have a ranking, you know, one through 20 of all the couriers in our network and we dispatch it to number one first. And they only have two minutes to accept it. If they don't accept it, it goes to number two. This all happens automatically. And it's, it's happening across 400 cities at the same time. Now, when we started this, this uh, platform, Scott, it didn't have AI. You know, it was, it was not an AI driven solution. It was a digital dispatch where we had a human that would see the order come in and they would select from a drop down list which courier we would use in a city. And we used to manage 80 deliveries a day for Menard's Home Improvement with one employee. And thankfully, we only were doing three or 400 deliveries a day at that point. Um, today, one person on our team, they don't dispatch anything because it's all AI automatic dispatch. One person can oversee 3,000 deliveries a day. We'd have over 2,000 employees dispatching deliveries today if we didn't implement AI. Oh, wow. And to me, that's a really compelling statement. Um, and now we're starting to utilize AI uh, around proof of delivery. You know, think about a wholesaler 
uh, like Advance Auto Parts, you know, they're sending parts to uh, various repair shops, 250,000 repair shops across the country. Uh, we have the ability now uh, to analyze a proof of delivery at an 88% accuracy to determine if that item was really delivered or not, which has big implications if maybe one of those repair shops say they didn't get their items. But a human mm -hmm. doesn't have to look at it. That's the point, is we yeah. can do that validation without a human. So we've leveraged AI a lot. About a year ago, we appointed our first EVP of data science in AI. His name's David Dashler. He was our first CTO. And he's now built out a team. When we engage with a big customer, we actually give them some dedicated cycles with our data science and AI team so that we can start to understand how to lower their delivery rates. Hmm. That's one of the best use cases I've, I've heard so far for, for AI. I mean, everybody's talking about it and the, and yeah. the business cases are obvious, but I mean, what, what you said about how many employees you would need to, to do what you're doing now, that, that's, that's incredible. But much like the whole solution, what well, probably the biggest compliment I've ever received was from a guy named Bill Hancock. Bill is the chief supply chain officer at U.S. Foods, uh, which is one of our customers. And Bill uh, did a diligence call with one of our new investors a couple of years ago. And he said, yeah, Bill, I told him, he was telling me, Bill, <laughs> Bill to Bill, that <laughs> he told the investors that OneRail uh, was, was a solution that was built to solve a problem. It wasn't a solution looking for a problem. Mm -hmm. So us developing this AI machine learning in version one of our of our of our true platform, it wasn't because we wanted to go out and, and dazzle the markets by saying AI. It's because we had to. It's because we couldn't possibly scale and have a real business if we didn't. Um so let's move on to sustainability. You know, that's a critical focus for supply chain managers. You know, how can companies balance the need for eco-friendly practices and last mile delivery with that demand for, you know, that constant demand for fast and more, more reliable service? Yeah. So, so it all starts with, um, you know, the platform that we've built is designed to optimize cost. So it can optimize cost by reducing and or eliminating miles. So an example of eliminating miles would be, you know, instead of running five hotshot deliveries, and I'm sure everybody probably that's tuning in knows what a hotshot is. It's going directly from store to customer with no other stop in between. It's an ASAP delivery is what we call it. Mm. Uh, so five hotshots is gonna burn, you know, five discrete paths where if you could batch, you know, and basically instead of uh, running five hot shots, you could run a five stop route, you're saving sometimes 30, 40% on mileage. So that, that has a profound impact. The platform is designed to do that. That's one of the things it's designed to do. But there's another way you can optimize too. We're finding, you know, it starts with the carriers. There's a lot of carriers out there that have been progressive. Um, and they've actually invested in electric fleets or, or low carbon fleets. So when we sign a contract with a new carrier to do deliveries for us, um, one of the things that we know, do you have electric or low carbon vehicles? Because we have customers that have asked us, hey, we want our deliveries to be prioritized, to be matched only to electric or low carbon. And then if, the, if there is no match, in other words, there's no electric or low carbon vehicles in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which there, mm -hmm. there may or may not be, then it's going to go to a traditional courier with, you know, with a gas aspirated engine. So um, that, that's how, that's how, that's a couple of use cases, practical use cases. And we're seeing more and more uh, private fleets, uh, you know, retailers that have their own internal fleets, wholesalers, product manufacturers, make that investment. American Tire Distributors has made an investment in electric fleet. Um, so right now I think, you know, the world is, is evolving. It's going to take a little bit of time for that to all reach some level of meaningful scale, but yes, we can do it. You know, it really is the limitation of, of the network that's out there and there just isn't enough electric. So right now the primary focus is reducing miles, eliminating miles. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. Um, you know, switching gears a little bit. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, dynamic fulfillment network. And and before yeah. we, we do that, I, I wonder if you could just kind of give us a 
you know, an explanation of the concept. Just Yeah. So, so again, our journey has been interesting. We've, we've kind of had three stages here. The first stage was, Hey, we're going to go be a tech connected courier and learn a bunch of stuff. And we did. And we learned just how hard it is to be a tech connected courier. If I have empathy for anybody, it's the couriers and the carriers. It's hard, really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did that, but then we evolved to become one rail. We built our platform, our omni channel, uh, omni point platform. We went out and aggregated this network of 12 million drivers. We have a team of 50 people, 66 people now actually that sit over the top of all of our deliveries that manage exceptions. Um, the next phase of that evolution just happened. We acquired a company called OrderBot and OrderBot is an order management uh, solution, order, order and inventory management. They serve Staples Canada nationally, PetSense here in the United States. Um, and what we realized was there's a huge gap upstream in the order management process. And the reason that gap exists, a lot of the legacy order management systems are very static, obviously the opposite, right, of dynamic. So the way they work, if you're in a browsing session with a retailer, you have a discrete zip code where you, where you sit. That zip code then relates to a store. The inventory you see is within that store, but there may be 20 other stores around you within a 30 mile radius. You can't see that inventory. So now imagine if I'm a retailer, and that one store only has nine of 10 items. I have to tell the customer now, we only have nine of 10 items. You can only get nine items today. Now that creates an option. I can have something parcel shipped in. I could potentially have uh, the customer go pick it up at another store location or the, or the customer just says the heck with it. I'm, I'm just going to abandon my cart. Those are not good options. None of those are good options. So what we've done, the reason we bought OrderBot was to couple the capability of understanding, you know, order management and transportation in the same transaction. So imagine if I'm a customer now, I can have a browsing session. It's not tethered to my local store based on a zip code. I can see all 20 stores simultaneously. Um, the retailer basically then passes that data off to us of every store that has order in full. And then in real time, we can pick a store that's further away. Maybe it's two miles further and it's going to cost an extra $3, but we can deliver the whole order same day versus in that static situation. The retailer is basically saying, hey, I'm defaulting to the closest store to the customer. The theory was that's that's going to be the lowest cost store to fulfill from. The answer is it's really not. The, the lowest cost fulfillment solution because it what's the cost of an abandoned cart? What's the cost of a $20 parcel shipment when you could have spent $2 more to pick it at a different store? So imagine, Scott, this is a triangulation of three things, consumer, inventory, and transportation, all simultaneously like a credit card payment happening in yeah. milliseconds. That's dynamic Very cool. fulfillment. Very cool. Um, you know, another thing, let's talk about reverse logistics. So, you know, how can companies effectively manage returns? That's a that's a loaded question. And, and, and it, it, for a lot of reasons, I think there's really not been a dominant return solution emerge. I think the first the first way that I would answer that question is returns are very similar to last mile in that there's a lot of types of returns, right? When I say last mile, if I had a room of a thousand people, there's gonna be a thousand visions of what last mile means. Some people think it thinks it just means DoorDash and marketplaces. Some people th might think it means some of those 15 minute delivery companies, a lot of which failed in Europe, like Gorillas and, and others, Joker, you know, those things flamed out. You can't do 15 minute delivery at a rate the customer wants to pay. And then they mm -hmm. think FedEx and UPS, right? So when I say returns, I, same thing, a thousand different opinions of what returns mean. I think, I think where we're headed, you know, is to have, again, flexibility is the key. If I'm a retailer and the gross margin on an item is less than 20%, am I going to dispatch 
a driver to go pick that up from a customer? Probably not, right? Probably mm -hmm. better off letting them leverage a returns network. So companies like Inmar, uh, who is a partner of ours, have built an amazing last mile returns network. You can, you can go to Kohl's just like you do for Amazon and drop something off. Uh, you know, it, it's a great network. There's different pieces of that, uh, that whole solution that you need to have so you can have flexibility. So return network is part of it. A proper RMA process to give the customer the ability to print a label um, to get to a disposition point is, is another key component. Having a flexible network like OneRail in place is a, is a piece of it. Um, and I think the problem is it's such a rule, kind of think of it as rule-driven requirement because no two returns are, are the same. You have a couch from Wayfair and you have a, a garment, you know, and, and we know a lot of people over order just to see which ones they like the best. That makes things yeah. a lot more challenging too. So I'm not, I don't know if I'm answering your question as concisely as maybe you or the audience would like, but the reality is returns are still ways off. I think, I think we're still in a mode of making things go forward the right way. I think there's a lot yeah. of progress around returns. But I think you'll see returns over the next three to five years become a, a bigger priority um, mm. now that I think a lot of the last mile problems are are getting solved. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, so how should supply chain managers adapt their last mile delivery strategies to meet customers' changing demands while maintaining high levels of, of customer satisfaction? Well, it really comes down to they have to be able to take control. And I think a, a big problem that I've seen for a lot of reasons, I'm going to bring it back to the top, because they didn't have the right technology, the example of a static OMS fulfillment versus dynamic fulfillment, uh, the concept of trying to use a TMS solution to do last mile fulfill from store. Good luck with that. You know, that's how we that's how we emerged, because TMS solutions don't solve that problem. It's static, just like the OMS zip code equals carrier zip code equals carrier. How do you architect that so that it can go 30 minutes or next day or scheduled? How do you do that so that it can select the right carrier or courier, you know, in the right place at the right time based on their demand cycle? Um, you can't. So I think if I'm a supply chain manager, you know, if I, if I want to put my customer first, uh, I absolutely must have the right technology stack. And uh, I think I think in a lot of cases, a lot of customers that we encounter, supply chain managers, are a little overwhelmed uh, because there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, interconnected dynamics between these platforms. And now we're talking about platforms I've never heard of. You know, what is an omni-channel orchestration platform? You know, what does that do? Uh, mm -hmm. So part of it is education. You know, I... The other thing I'll say, and I'm going to modify, if I'm allowed, modify the question a little bit. If I'm a supply chain manager, I think one of the biggest challenges I have is learning how to be more cross-functional. Um, supply chain managers and transportation managers have worked in silos for a long time because it just wasn't thought of as strategically as it is today. The good news for supply chain and transportation managers should be that your job is now more strategic than ever. Uh, supply chain, chief supply chain officers, you know, a lot of times were relegated to reporting to a COO, not the CEO. Now you're seeing chief supply chain officers report to the CEO and for, for a damn good reason. So um, I think it starts with, if I'm a supply chain manager, I need to embrace the fact that my job is more strategic. And in our biggest, most successful uh, customer engagements, we see this being very, very cross-functional. Store operations gets involved, tech, chief digital officer, marketing, transportation. Chief supply chain officer typically has oversight over transportation. So it's really all these things um, playing into it. Um, but that, that's how they need, they need to adapt how they think about the org and how it all has to come together if they really want to transform. Um, and that's probably the biggest question. Do they want to transform or do they want to put a Band-Aid on it? You know, because mm -hmm. there, there's ways to put a Band-Aid on it. There's ways to inch up on it. You don't have to, you know, go through a two or three year transformation to be successful. Um, but I think that's one of the bigger questions uh, that they need to ask around that adaptation. 
Um, and, and again, the right technology, the right carrier procurement strategy, those two things alone can put the customer at the center of the universe. The capacity is there. Um, so how do you take control? You take control by installing the right technology, finding the right partner, designing the SLAs that meet your customers' needs and, and service requirements. And then, and then you're in control and you have that flexibility. Hmm. All right, great. Hey, we had a couple of questions come in from the audience here. Uh, one came in from, from Melvin who's asking, does, does one rail have its own delivery force or is, is everyone a third party driver employed by employed by the, the courier entities? Yeah, great question. So I'm just going to bring up a, a slide here. So our solution has three components, OmniPoint platform, which we've talked about. The second component is where we're crowdsourcing supply. And the answer is we don't own a truck, right? We're doing 260,000 deliveries a day. We don't own a truck. Only in 2024 can you do that, I guess. Um, <laughs> but we, uh, we are a network of networks. So what that means is we have contracts with a thousand carriers. Each of those carriers have uh, you know, between one and a million drivers you know, we have some huge networks like Uber and uh, DoorDash. And we have some small mom and pops, you know, that are operating a couple trucks. And that's really what's great about, I think, what we built mm -hmm. is that we've been really, I think, very helpful to some of these smaller carriers that may never see volume from these Fortune 50 companies. Um, but what we're doing, instead of managing drivers, we made a big decision to manage entities. So we have a logistics partner success team of, of eight people. All they do are build relationships with our logistics providers and then have weekly kind of check-ins on quality with the top, you know, with the highest volume providers. Uh, they all get a report card every week of SLA compliance, what they need to work on by market. Um, and that's how we do it. We manage it by data. You know, we're managing uh, the outputs of a delivery. And, and then that's a perpetual cycle of how we manage you know, to try to kind of coach that courier up uh, to do a better job. And the platform also works, uh, you know, it, it, again, I mentioned kind of the AI component, the platform is going to reduce the volume that's going to a courier that, that's starting to see, you know, over index on, on late deliveries or loss runs or, or other problems that are impacting our customers. So that's happening automatically. And then the human component steps in and, you know, we manage them face to face virtually, obviously, once a week. So yeah, that's that's how we do it. Very cool. Great. I uh, should know, you know, too, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. Something that's really unique, I think, about OneRail, we give our customers one rate card. So if you think about the challenge, if I want to execute a transportation strategy that involves many carriers so that I can increase my quality, and lower my cost, that means I have to manage a thousand rate cards. Like that's really hard to do. Our technology is key to that. And if I'm a shipper and I use one rail, I get a one rail rate card. That's it. You get one rate card. So there's going to be for us, we have to manage a thousand rate cards. That's our problem. So we try to make it really easy for our customers to engage with us, get all the capacity they need in one place. Uh, some of them have relationships with couriers. We, we certainly can onboard those rate cards if, if they if they want to maintain those relationships. Um, but that that rate card component is really key. Interesting. OK. All right, Melvin, thanks for that question. Uh, a question from Denise. Uh, I was wondering, does OneRail provide food traceability data for food being shipped and received? So what we're doing today uh, around around food, is, you know, we're working with U.S. Foods, really our first big enterprise customer uh, in the perishable space. And our API uh, has been architected to handle temperature. So we, we can handle temperature. Uh, we can see temperature at all times. Uh, that's reportable on the dashboard. Uh, it'll throw exception flags when, when temperatures reach a threshold that's set by the shipper. Uh, and then the other thing is we provide complete scan in and scan out capabilities. So that's our chain of custody product. It's called inventory visibility. So when you merge those two things, we can we can provide scan in and out of a warehouse, in and out of a, any distribution point, onto a truck, off of a truck. Uh, couple that with temperature control at all times, and you have um, 
you really have, I think, a complete solution around the chain. Of, as now, obviously, there's a limitation there. If we're working with a carrier that does not have temperature control, that's a problem. So we would only work with carriers that have a temperature control uh, component that we can report on with our API and make decisions on with our API. So there's always a limitation, right? We're, we're, we're swimming in a world of nuances in supply chain, but I, I, I'd be irresponsible not to point that out. Okay, gotcha, great. Uh, thanks for the question, Denise. Uh, so, Bill, we've we've talked about a lot here today. You know, if you had to, what are the, what are the you know two to three key takeaways that that you want the audience uh, to leave here today knowing? Yeah, great, great question. So, it starts with you're in control. You know, we find a lot of customers don't feel like they're in control. I, I was on a panel, yeah, two or three years ago at Home Delivery World, and it was right right immediately after COVID outbreak happened. So there was a lot of sensitivity and it was interesting because a question came from the audience about the balance of power and balance of control between a shipper and a carrier. And, and there was an overwhelming feeling at the time because of the driver shortage and a lot of problems that the retailer didn't really feel like they were in control anymore. They felt like mm. the carriers were in control. The reality is, both parties need to be in control of what they should be responsible for. And if I'm a retailer, I should be able to architect any experience I want. You know, I shouldn't have to be limited because my carrier only does X, Y, or Z. And to me, it sounds silly, but realize you're in total control. You just need the technology and the tools to be in control. And if, if you don't have that, it's hard to be in control, but you can be in control. Uh, I went through this same dynamic with my last company when we created a digital coupon solution and we were the first company to aggregate all the coupons into one place for these grocery retailers. And when we told them we were going to do it, they said, well, how do, how do you, how do you know we can do that? Because you're the retailer and you can demand it. That's why. And you have leverage, use your leverage, you know, take the, take control. So that's one key component is realize that the tools exist to do that. The second thing is, Cross-functional is the key to success in, in Last Mile. Last Mile is highly cross-functional. Um, I, I was asked this question at, at a Gartner conference, I think last year, you know, how important is cross-functional uh, collaboration to making supply chain work? I can't emphasize enough, it's a 10 out of 10. If you go into it, you know, thinking in a silo, whether that's a transportation silo or Maybe you're a head of strategy and trans, well, heads of strategy and transformation are, are, are naturally cross-functional, bad example. But if you go into it thinking you can solve the problem as a, as a CMO or a CDO, or for that matter, you know, any, any kind of verticalized title, you just can't, you know, you, you must be cross-functional. And that's why we've seen a lot of our biggest opportunities. When I say biggest, successful, come down from heads of strategy and transformation because they're working that whole organization and they're, they're, they're acting upon the goals and objectives of the board and the C team. So they have the ability to work across different operators in a business to make it work. And if you want to make it work, it has to be cross-functional. Um, hmm. And the third, the third takeaway, and this is probably one of the bigger ones, you got to shift the mindset from being a logistics and supply chain problem to being a shopper marketing problem. It's a shopper marketing problem we're, we're solving. The way we solve it is we fix supply chain and logistics problems. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, if you think of it, and it doesn't matter if you're a wholesale distributor or a consumer facing retailer or CPG, um, you're still at the end of the day, it's all about customer experience. It's all about winning the heart and the mind of the customer. And to do that, you have a lot of work to do to get your supply chain and logistics stack, your tech stack in order. Again, think differently about how you procure transportation, be a multi-carrier strategy uh, leader um, and, and, and take control of that design of that whole experience. It's a shopper marketing problem. So the quicker you can sort of get into that headspace, I think the quicker you can, you can solve the whole problem, which is you know, how to at least be on par with the market leaders. 
Well, Bill, I, I think that's a great place to to leave it. Um, thank you so much for the, this conversation. Is is really been fascinating, and uh, I mean, it's just such a fast moving industry. Um, really appreciate you uh, giving us a handle on uh, on it. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity today. You know, we uh, we certainly uh, we're not perfect. You know, we have our perspective uh, from our from our uh, where we sit and. I feel I feel like uh, we are a lot of times our biggest critic and our customers are the judge. And, you know, we try really hard in these types of moments to just articulate best practices. You know, what's working, what's not working. Uh, so thank you for the forum to do that today. Yep. And thanks for all the insights there on, on the best practices. All right. Take care, Bill. OK, and we have uh, one last piece of business here. Um, before we wrap up, and that's an Amazon gift card prize drawing, and the winner of the $250 Amazon gift card today is Carlos Bates from Georgia. So congratulations to Carlos Bates. We'll be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the Smart Brief team, I want to thank OneRail and, and Bill for, for making this event possible. And thanks, as always, for attending and for your great questions. That's going to conclude today's event. Have a fantastic rest of your day.